The belt of sexual dependency has been the defining work of my life. And it's the thing that sustains my name and that people most want to hear about. I started it in the early 80s. It is a slideshow. This is almost a book of a film in that the slideshow existed long before the book and it continues to exist. I just made a new interpretation of it, a new edit of it, in 2008. Actually two, one for the MoMA and one for a private collector. So the slideshow is about now 48 minutes with maybe 30 different songs. The um, text of the songs act as the narrative of the film. Before the book came out, I did variations of the slideshow all over the world. That's what I did to make a living, is I traveled around Europe showing the slideshow in underground cinemas, in radical play, underground places, and then more, more and more museums. And sometimes it was an hour and a half, sometimes it was 20 minutes, I used different songs, and the definitive version of the slideshow was made in 1987, and then that's the last time I cut a soundtrack. So when the book came out, a dealer gallerist bought one of every picture in the book, and then years later he sold it to a collector who then gave it to the museum. and. The prints are just as important to me as the slideshow. I think books are the great medium for photography, and I think it's the only art that really works in books. But I think that the prints also, especially shown in quantity, have a very intense effect, similar to the book. In 1985, Aperture actually came to me and asked to do a book of the slideshow. And it was a long and difficult process. Um, we spent about six months on it. We cut it down, three of us, into the form that the uh, introduction is now. The introduction is really important. It's four pages three or four pages, and it explains really what the meaning of my work is. First of all, there's a misunderstanding that my work is about marginalized people. And we were never marginalized because we were the world. We didn't care what straight people thought of us. We had no time for them. They didn't show up in our radar. So we weren't marginalized from anything. We were many, many people living a similar lifestyle. And there were some political beliefs behind it for some people, but it was somewhat transgressive against normal society, but it was not about outcasts or marginalized people. Only the most straight people can see it that way still. I grew up in a family where the person I was closest to committed suicide. And this affected my whole life and it's at the time, and it still does. What killed her was that she was born at the wrong time, and she had no tribe. She had no other people like her. And the family was very revisionist. So what happened didn't happen. And I wanted so much to know what was going on in the neighbor's house, and I wanted the neighbors to know what was going on in my house. I thought the wrong things were kept secret, and that I still do. And I think that revisionism is so dangerous, and it's still popular for people to revise what happened to them in their life. So this book for me, and why I took the pictures from the beginning, was proof that I lived this and no one could revise it. I think the essence of the ballad is about the struggle in relationships between intimacy and autonomy. That's what the piece is really about. 
and it's about the dependency one can get on another person that's totally inappropriate for them on every level. But the sex is good, and the sexual connection is so strong. So the bottom line is about male-female relationships and why they don't work and the different language that men and women speak, the different ways they're brought up, violence that can occur in relationships, the ambivalence that people find hard to sustain, and the struggle for autonomy within a relationship and to let the other person be autonomous. So it's about the difficulty in relating, and it's not about what kind of people, it's about my friends. I think there's almost no one in the book that I didn't live with at some time. And in those days, before there was any gentrification, I sometimes had 13 people living there. I ended up living there alone or with a lover, but in those days, in the early 80s, people came and went for periods of time. And all of these people were my friends. Unfortunately, a lot of people are dead from AIDS. And that was a plague that hit my community really unbelievably intensely. And the ballad is also about that for me, is how many people have disappeared and how essential they were. I think my friends are particularly sensitive people, particularly creative. Um, and fabulous people with a ma great imagination. And I'm showing them in their own home lives, in sometimes out in the world, in their relationships to each other, and in their relationships with themselves. The camera was like an extension of my hand, and I just shot all day. I never moved anything. For me, it was a sin to move a beer bottle out of the way, because it had to be exactly what it was. And that was really the bottom line about photography for me, was to show exactly what it was. Basically, I used whatever camera came into the bar that I was working in and bought, you know, off the um, people who stole equipment. I always hated people who talked about their cameras and their equipment and their printing. For me, it was the content that mattered and not the quality of the print. But I did care about my film stock because I have a very saturated vision. I decided recently that it came because I didn't wear glasses for years and I can't really see without glasses. So all I see is colors. I don't see the details of things. There was a lot of flash also in the ballad pictures, which I no longer use. I didn't know there was any natural light. I thought there was day and night, and I lived at night. I seriously didn't know until about 1989 that the color of everything is changed by the light of the day. That was a huge epiphany for me. So a lot of these, because they're taken inside and there's a sense of claustrophobia, you could say. There's a lot of flash photography. This was at a time when people like Harry Callahan, Edward Weston, were the kind of gods of photography. So nothing like the ballad had happened as a book before except Larry Clark's book that was published in the 70s called Tulsa. And that had a huge influence on me because he was shooting and print publishing work from his own life. And there weren't people doing that at the time. The work wasn't taken seriously, um, particularly by male photographers. I was booed. I got into a lot of fights. A lot of men told me it wasn't, a lot of people told me it wasn't photography, it wasn't good. And I didn't really care about good photography. I cared about complete honesty. And it's not something you can try to do. It's something that I had to take pictures to stay alive. And I believe that any artist 
has to do their work to stay alive.